before the beginning there was this turtle, and the turtle was alone, and he looked around, and he saw his neighbor, which was his mother, and he lay down on top of his neighbor, and behold, she bore him in tears, an oak tree, which grew all day, and then fell over, like a bridge, and lo, under the bridge there came a catfish, and he was very big, and he was walking, and he was the biggest he had seen, and so were the fiery balls of this fish, one of which is the sun, and the other they call the... Yes, some uncomplicated peoples still believe this myth. But here, in the technical vastness of the future, we can guess that surely the past was very different. We can surmise, for instance, that these two great... We know for certain, for instance, that for some reason, for some time in the beginning, there were hot lumps. Cold and lonely, they whirled noiselessly through the black holes of space. These insignificant lumps came together to form the first union, our sun, the heating system. And about this glowing gas bag rotated the earth, a cat's eye among Aggies, blinking in astonishment across the face of time. Well, we were covered with a molten scum of rocks, bobbing on the surface like rats. Later, when there was less heat, these giant rock groups settled down among the land masses. During this extinct time, our earth was like a steam room, and no one, not even man, could get in. However, the oceans and the sewers were simmering with a rich protein stew, and the mountains moved in to surround and protect them. They didn't know then that living, as we know it, was already taken over. Animals without backbones hid from each other, or fell down. Clamosaurs and oysterettes appeared as appetizers. Then came the sponges, which sucked up about ten percent of all life. Hundreds of years later, in the late devouring period, fish became obnoxious. Trailer bites, chigger bites, and mosquitoes collided aimlessly in the dense gas. Finally, tiny edible plants sprang up and rose, giving birth to generations of insecticides and other small dying creatures. Millions of months passed, and twenty-eight days later, the moon appeared. This small change was reflected best, perhaps, in the sand dollar, which shrank to almost nothing at the bottom of the pool, where even dumb amphibians like catfish laid their eggs in the boiling waters, only to be gobbled up every three minutes by the giant sea orphans and jungle bunnies, which scared everybody. And so, in fear and hot water, Man is born. I am La Brea Man. I am first man. Wife and I live in pits. I discover pain and boredom, and how to use hands in self-defense. I am his son. I am called Plowman. I was the first to dig the earth and make the rivers run backwards. There was no stopping me, or my wife. I, I am have his many, many cousins. cousins. I chipped the stones. I smelt the rocks. I bronzed the shoes. I laid the asphalt. Together, Together we made enough noise to keep the wolves awake. I am his godson, civilized man. I harnessed the secret of the calendar, and with the power of the weak, I built the pyramids. I am his mentor, Hippocrates. I sent him to school where he learned to stand up for a principal and sit down on his own stool. I am his father, Caesarian. I sent him away from home for something to live on and paid him to fight over it. So now, everywhere he went, man dropped a great load of knowledge, forming a rich compost where slumbered the modifying spark of humanity. Yet it was not many years later, in the little Flemish town of Cotterdam, that the restless chemist Sir Sidney Fudd was to make that particularly momentous entry in his scientific journey. Your opted, serpted, fuddles. <laughs> Dear Nabby, yes, darling, darling Nabby, thanks for the pomegranates. Bunky loved them and will be sitting up soon, I hope. As for the excellent porcelain astrolabe, 
which miraculously arrived in precise working condition after its perilous journey round the tit oh tit there's p there i set it up directly and having once aligned it along the celestial doggy the sight so roused me that i was seized by a transport of scientific rapture and whilst a happy prisoner in this unhappy state I fell upon my glorious machine and knocked it perforce down the kitchen stairs, carrying faithful Bunky, Spunky, with it. You can imagine my confusion. But quid malbug in plano, consternation turned to elucidation. Period there. Could this be the solution to our problems, both personal and scientific? Howsoever, a devilish natural principle of science hath revealed itself. Exclamation point and through my quivering quill i present it to you thus quote, if you push something hard enough it will fall over end quote. so little did this console poor spunky that i was compelled to lie on her for at least a if you push something hard enough it will fall over fudd's first law of opposition how can we best illustrate the stubborn consistency of this eternal principle by walking down this shady New England drive on Wednesday, 1875. We pause before the grounded iron gate of Dr. Beddoe's Pneumatic Institute and eavesdrop upon two members of the Amateur Electrical League. Dick! Dick! She works! It does! It does, Tom! It comes in and goes out like... like anything! To think, all I had to do was put the balls on the other side! Look at them spin now! Aren't they beautiful? Oh, Tom, Tom, those balls will mean your fortune. By Fudd, I'll patent this machine and name it after Nancy. What, you mean pushover? Yes, because that's what she does, and she'll run everything. Everywhere. Every time. Forever. For everybody. It comes in. It must go out. Teslicles deviant to Fudd's law. So, with the invention of the motor-operated pushover, Man and science gave birth to life here today in the future. Man, woman, child, all is up against the wall of science.